My review of the Dingbats journal was chock full of surprises and they were all positive. So much to like and a lot to talk about. Hi, I'm Ruby from the Youthful Journal. Like this video and subscribe to my channel for reviews of over 40 bullet journals. Today I'm reviewing a Dingbats Earth Collection journal. I will talk a bit about the company and their products. I will talk about the packaging of the journal, the features and markings of the journal. I will talk about the construction, the paper. I do a very detailed pen test that includes watercolor. And I also talk about the company's approach to social and environmental responsibility. Dingbat's journals are designed and made in Lebanon and the company also maintains offices in the United Kingdom and the United Arab Emirates. These additional offices help them facilitate smooth operations to their international customers. Dingbats entered the international notebook arena in 2012, continuing an extremely long family tradition in producing paper products as the company Society Kamel Bekdash. There are three collections of journals. The Earth Collection has five different colors and bullet journal markings and only comes in dot grid and A5 size. The Wildlife Collection has 10 colors no markings, comes in four sizes, and dot grid, lined, plain, or grid. The new soft cover version of the Wildlife Journal has six colors in A5 with dot grid or lined pages, and the Pro Collection has two black covers and only comes in B5 with dot grid, lined, or blank pages. Their UK-based .com website sells journals internationally, but you can also get Dingbat's journals through Amazon and other wholesalers. Basically, it's pretty widely available. I bought mine from a shop in Vancouver in Canada. The journal can sometimes be cheaper on Amazon than on the Dingbat's website, but if we use the Dingbat's price as standard, it works out at 13 US cents per page. It's pretty standard and by no means expensive. And if you take into account some of the journal's credentials, it's quite reasonable. The journal comes in thin plastic wrap and has no belly band, but does come with a pamphlet in the rear pocket. There is no free gift. The Dingbats journals have a stamped picture on the front cover that sets the theme for the journal and is matched with an informative inside cover about the region. The brand name is stamped on the back cover. There are a couple of colors in the wildlife collection where there isn't much distinction between the cover color and the stamped image. And I prefer it when the image is a little bit more distinct. The journal is closed with a black 7mm elastic that wraps around to the back cover and leaves a slight imprint on the edges and the back cover. There are two ribbons in the colours of the journal that are long enough to maintain your hold on them around the corner of the book. There is a black pen loop glued between the back cover and the concertina pocket. The pocket is quite thick and only extends three quarters of the way across the page. Because of the thickness, it would have been better to extend all the way across because it's a noticeable bump when writing on the last few pages. It also opens quite wide, meaning things can slip out more easily. The page edges are plain, the corners are rounded, the journal weighs just over 450 grams, which is pretty light, and the journal is 19 millimeters thick. There is absolutely nothing negative to say about the construction of this journal, which I have to say is a refreshing change. The Dingbats journal has a stitched book binding. When you open the book, it doesn't quite lie flat. And what I mean by that is that while the book stays open, there is always a small valley at the spine. 
You can see the difference in the way the spine folds when it's open compared to journals that lay truly flat. There are 12 signatures. This journal is an example of how joins between signatures can be done perfectly. There is no glue coming through the stitching from the spines and the glue join between signatures doesn't sit up from the spine at all. The pages sit inside the cover and while there's a greater overhang at the top and the bottom than on the side, the side of the pages are still adequately protected. The ribbons have been glued between a lining strip and the binding, so seem to be slightly more secure than some ribbons. I think this is likely to be a pretty durable journal, but if you really want to find out, I suggest you look at uh, some people that have used the journal and see what they say about it. As I mentioned earlier, a special feature of the Dingbats journals is the information about the environment of a specific region on the inside cover. My particular journal covers the Eduardo Avaroa Reserve in Bolivia, hence the llama on the cover. If you really, really don't want to be educated on this, I suppose you could stick the pages together. The next page and the inside back page is a decorative lining sheet that matches the cover theme. The page markings are original. First, there is a guide to how to use the tabs in this journal. Next, we have the tab key page where we can add details about pages marked with a certain color that you use to fill in the half circle on the edge of the pages. These half circle tab marks are on every page of the journal. There are 12 tabs, so you could use these for each month if you fit 12 months in a journal. Otherwise, you could use them to mark topics. Coloring right on the edge of the page means it's visible when the journal is closed. I'm quite confused that on the next page there is space for a color key. And I suppose you could highlight text throughout your journal and a certain color means a certain thing but that's kind of what the tabs are for. So I'm not exactly sure and they don't really explain what the difference is between the tabs key page and the color key page. Next is the dingbat key, which is your opportunity to record how you're going to mark tasks versus events and notes. There is a three page index with lined pages and then two double page spreads for a future log that very helpfully include markings to split the page in thirds either across or down the page. You could just ignore the future log markings and use these pages as normal dot grid pages because the markings are quite faint and the page numbers do start on these pages. There are a total of 184 dot grid pages, including the future log pages. The page numbers stand out with a number inside a dark circle, and unfortunately, they're located inside the dot grid. This means that if you draw boxes on your page, you will rule through the number. There are 29 dots across the page and 40 down the page. The dots are gray and an average darkness, although the third test gray marker only just concealed the dots. If you squint hard, you can see them. Unfortunately, the dots are not quite spaced at five millimeter intervals. I got about an extra two millimeters along the length of the page, making the dots about 5.05 millimeters apart. It's not enough to mess with using a ruler, but it is a little bit annoying. Strangely, they're an accurate five millimeters across the page. The dots are well aligned with no more than one millimeter variation across double page spreads, and they are always an equal distance from the page edges and the center fold, meaning that you can use the two center rows as columns in a table. For instance, when you have a month tracker with days across the double page spread. 
There is no pen test page and the last seven pages of the journal are perforated. There are two things that you notice straight away when you open a Dingbats journal. The 100 GSM paper is on the caramel side of cream and definitely the darkest that I've seen. The second thing I noticed was how buttery smooth the paper is. This is ideal for pens and especially fountain pens, but not so good for things that need a bit of tooth like pencils, colored pencils and whiteout. To achieve that smoothness, Dingbat's paper is obviously coated. When I did my watercolor test, no paint at all soaked into the page and on the wet on wet test, it swam around on the surface until the pigment settled into low points on the page and to the edges of the painted area. Not ideal. The coating does mean that this 100 GSM paper has no bleed through and very little ghosting. The only things that ghosted through were the usual Sharpie ultrafine marker and the black ink pad. It's worth noting that the drawing ink didn't ghost through or where I colored with Tombow dual brush pens. Lead pencil erased cleanly None of the whiteouts suited the creamy paper. There was no feathering at all and no texture or resistance from the paper when writing with fountain pens. But whenever we get paper this smooth, we do get smearing problems. It took 18 seconds for a Pigma Micron pen to stop smearing when I brushed my hand across it and the pen smeared when I highlighted over it after 20 seconds. Watercolours don't cause much page wrinkle and don't bleed through the paper, both good, but they don't look great because they swim around on the surface too much. If you really insist on using watercolour, I'd stick to minimising the water as much as possible. Dingbats promote themselves as the environmental choice for journaling. The journal is certified as vegan by V-Label, a European certification scheme. This means there are no animal products in the polyurethane cover. The sizing, which is the gelatin that is used to stop things permeating the paper, and in the glues. This is highly unusual for paper products and takes a lot of extra effort and cost to achieve. I've done a little video to explain what's involved. The V-Label certification does not look into packaging and dingbats don't comment on this much, but given that a lot of people would buy dingbats through Amazon, who has an appalling reputation for packaging, I once ordered some washi tape and they put three rolls of washi tape in a huge A3 plastic bubble wrap envelope. So I'm going to say a no for vegan packaging. In addition to being vegan, the paper pulp is sourced through sustainable forestry practices and certified under the FSC scheme. I'm impressed that they post their certificates for FSC and V-Label on their website. In addition to mentioning their certificate number when they mention FSC certification elsewhere. The only aspect of their environmental marketing material that I don't really appreciate is their focus on the cover being degradable after 10 years if it's mixed in compost in controlled temperatures. This isn't a major concern as most people tend to keep their journals, but if it was disposed of, it probably wouldn't be in the ideal conditions and rubbish tips tend not to have enough oxygen for the process. In addition to this, while the cover may degrade and break down, it actually just turns into microplastics, which then filter into the aquatic environment and end up in our food and our water supply, and so end up in animals and in us. Dingbats also mention carbon neutral shipping. 
This is a bit of a contentious area and if you're interested, I suggest you do your own research. The company doesn't share any information about the social and working conditions for the staff in their company. Lebanon does practice corporate social responsibility, but they don't have strict reporting guidelines and dingbats do have an office in the United Arab Emirates, which has a bit of a checkered history in terms of human rights and how they treat women. So look, this may not reflect on how dingbats runs their own office in that country, but they don't talk about it. It would be good to see dingbats comment on their website on social responsibility, just so we know that they're at least monitoring working conditions and the social health of their staff. I had held off on buying dingbats journals purely because they use the word recyclable in their marketing, which kind of pushes the responsibility onto the end user and it isn't about the company itself taking some responsibility. Now that I've looked into the journal and the company, I have to say I'm pretty impressed. Dingbats really are trying to do their best to reduce the impact of their products. The journal is well constructed. It has silky smooth paper that's great for fountain pens and there's no bleeding or ghosting from other pens. The downsides are the appearance of any watercolour painting, the smearing and for some people the creaminess of the paper would be off-putting. They have a large range of cover colours and designs and they also have a new soft cover version. Definitely a journal to try and I can understand why Dingbats has a dedicated following. Please like this video, subscribe to my channel where you will find lots of other review videos and journaling ideas. See ya!